Hi, I'm Mark Syme, the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. And these are the evening services for Sunday, November the 28th. I hope you have your songbooks with you. We're singing from songs of faith and praise. We will have a song service. Uh, we will observe the Lord's Supper. And we will have a lesson that I hope will be uh, beneficial to each one of you. So if you do have your songbook handy, uh, please turn them to number 325. 325. Boundless love, unending joy, this is my life, it's what I know. I can't believe that he selected me, Jesus my Lord, it's you I own. He keeps me when I'm weary, I can hear me when I pray. He's even there beside me when I fall. His love surrounds me, even when I go astray. I guess I have to say that he's my all. Boundless love, unending joy, this is my life, it's what I know. I can't believe that he selected me, Jesus my Lord, it's you I owe. When my world falls all around me, I call upon his name. And just in time, he takes me by the hand, whose ways are perfect, just like a son who bore my shame. And I don't even have to understand Boundless grace because of Calvary, his life he gave, his love outpoured. I now can live with him eternally, Jesus my Lord, it's you I love. And if you would turn your books to number 308. The rear weight. In vain in high and holy lace, my soul her grateful voice would raise. For who can sing the worthy praise of the wonderful love of Jesus? Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. My hope for pardon when I call, my trust for lifting when I fall. In life and death, my all in all is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Before we observe the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 366.
366. By Christ redeemed in Christ restored, we keep the supper of the Word, and show the death of our dear Lord until we His body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread. And as we drink, we see the blood until we come. And thus dark betrayal night with the last advent we unite by one bright chain of loving right until he In Acts, the 20th chapter, in verse 7, it tells us that Christians gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. We use that verse as the bedrock, uh, as the foundation, I think, of um, the Lord's Supper as being an integral and important part of our worship service to him. And so for those of you who are not able to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, we will observe it uh, this evening. We will remember Jesus' body, which he, given, he gave in our stead. We will remember the blood that he shed for each one of us. Uh, let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to sacrifice his life that we might live, that he might was willing to separate himself from God for a short period of time, that uh, he might take the sins of the world upon him. We're so grateful that this was your plan and so grateful that Jesus was willing to go through it and sacrifice himself for us. As we partake of the bread, we think of his body. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. We know that the blood that throw, flows through our bodies is what sustains life. It's what allows the life processes to proceed, that Jesus was willing to shed his blood for us is amazing. But the fact that that blood that he shed is the blood that washes away our sins is more amazing yet. We're so grateful that Jesus was willing to go to the cross to shed that innocent blood. We are so thankful for this, and we pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And on the first day of the week, we are commanded to lay by and store that with which we have been blessed. Uh, we just pray that uh, we would be uh, grateful for the blessings of life as we've just passed through this Thanksgiving season, that uh, we should be ever so thankful for what the Lord has done for each one of us. And at this time, reflect it now we return uh, some of our monetary blessings so that we can be the benevolent people that we ought to be and so that the church can spread your word. 
Let's pray for the giving. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to return to you what has always been yours. Help us to understand we're blessed because you are in our lives. And help us, dear Heavenly Father, that as we uh, remember what happened in the first century, as they did lay by in store, uh, we just pray that we would be willing to give what we have. We're so mindful of the woman who gave the two small coins, which reflected all that she had, back to the treasury. Bless us and uh, help those that uh, uh, minister uh, these funds to be good stewards of these monies that uh, we might be benevolent and we might be evangelistic. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And if you would turn your books to number uh, 1014. Children's song with an adult meaning. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died. Heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart of mine, make it pure and holy thine. On the cross you died for me, I will try to live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Thank you for participating in the song service with us uh, this evening. And now uh, the lesson of the evening. If you were there this morning or you watched via the live stream, uh, you know that uh, the title of uh, the lesson this evening is Faith and Love Firmly Fixed. Faith and Love Firmly Fixed. If we return to the book of Jude, that short book just before the book of Revelation, uh, it only has one chapter, and turn to verse 21. Verse 21 of Jude. Here's what it says. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. I want to focus on the first part of that verse that says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God. You know, um, I used to teach science and uh, I, uh, I used to teach a, a lesson in physical science about what made things stable. For example, um, a vase, if it has a broad base, is stable. It's very unlikely 
to fall over because the base is wide. It has a stability to it. Whereas if we uh, made that vase with a thin stem at the bottom and a small base, uh, it would be likely to tilt over. We look for stability in our lives and stability in our lives, uh, stability in our attitude toward God is one of our greatest spiritual needs. We don't want to be tilting over. We want our love for God and our relationship with God to be a powerful and a strong one. And you know, uh, I would dare say that if you're watching this uh, this evening, that you have some kind of church background most of us have a degree of love for God and we're willing to follow him. Now, how stable we are is based upon whether or not we are willing to follow him through all circumstances. Because there are those out there who um, are willing to follow God. But sometimes it doesn't always suit them. And so they might not follow him under all circumstances. But our, our devotion to God cannot be variable. It can't be unstable. Um, in experiments in science, when we try to prove a point, when I used to set up lab activities, one of the really important things I stressed to my students was you try to eliminate as many variables as you possibly can. Even in recipes, when you bake bread or you uh, make something that requires certain ingredients, if it doesn't turn out the way it's supposed to turn out, you try to figure out which variable was left out. Well, our devotion to God can't be filled with a bunch of variables. It, we, we can't allow it to fluctuate on the ups and downs of human circumstance. We need to appropriate the right amount of love for God. Now, the Hebrew writer, I think, put it in, in very, very good terms in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19. Hebrews 6, verse 19, where the Hebrew writer said, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. The, the hope and the, uh, uh, that we have, it, it's not variable. It's an anchor. Now, I don't know how many of you do much boating, but we know that there are times in our boats, uh, if we fish or whatever we might do, that, uh, that we put an anchor down. Now, many of you know that uh, my summer job for many years was out in the bay uh, catching clams. And... It, it consisted of me taking my boat out to where I thought the clams were and jumping in a fairly shallow water and trying to find the clams. Now, sometimes uh, uh, finding the clams necessitated me uh, to get a distance away from my boat. And uh, so I, I threw the anchor over. 
Now in my boat, what I've always done, learn this by trial and error, is right, uh, uh, oh, maybe four or five feet from the end of the anchor to the rope, I have a very, very heavy chain. And this heavy chain drops the anchor down. And I even do one more thing. Uh, before, uh, and especially on a breezy day, uh, before I jump out of the boat, I make sure I pull on the anchor to know that it has grabbed the bottom. Because the anchor, the anchor is what keeps the boat where it is. And for us, we need to appropriate a hope that is anchored within God's love. And it has to be anchored in God's love because, as Jude says, we want to keep ourselves in the love of God. We don't want to fall out of the parameters of the love of God. So that what happens to our devotion is that these little fluctuations won't cause us to move from one place to another. If I would put my anchor in and not test it to see whether it has grabbed and a strong wind would come up, all of a sudden my boat might move. Believe me, I have found this out on numerous occasions and have had to swim and run, especially in the wind, to try to get my boat. Because the anchor that was supposed to keep it there wasn't doing its job. And we need to anchor ourselves. That's what uh, the Hebrew writer says. The hope that we have is the anchor of the soul that keeps us stable, that eliminates the variables. The wind won't uh, allow the boat to go away. The rains won't allow the boat to go away. It's interesting and perhaps maybe just a tad embarrassing to consider the kind of things that might cause one's love for God to diminish. Remember, we don't want that to happen. We want our hope to be anchored. It's almost understandable that we lose our spiritual focus sometimes in times of stress, in times of sickness, and so forth. The reality of it is, is this is the time when our hope in God should get stronger and stronger. I have known people in our church who have gotten sick and, and we've prayed very hard for that person uh, and that person's family. And, uh, you know, if they were, uh, uh, incapable of getting about and doing things. We've supplied meals for them. Uh, and what happens very often is these people realize what their anchor is and feel the stability. But often, and embarrassingly enough, too often, when things don't go right, the first thing we do is withdraw from God. Now, let's go 180 degrees, and this is even more embarrassing, and this is even uh, more ironic, perhaps, and this is that when we are living a life of comfort and ease, and everything is going along smoothly. It seems as though sometimes that when we have more to be thankful for, the more we forget to be thankful. 
It's like the rich fool who had that great crop. I, I, I uh, did a series of devotionals about the rich fool. And the bumper crop that he had was such that he felt like, wow, my crop was so great, the barns won't even hold them. I'll build bigger barns so it can hold all that I have. And guess what? I don't have to work anymore. Uh, it said about <laughs> eat, drink, and be merry. I can be at ease. What the rich fool forgot was where the source of his blessings were. It doesn't say that he didn't give to the needy. What it said in the parable was that this rich fool was not rich toward God. And what God said to him was, all that you have won't do you any good because tonight your soul will be required of you. And so one reason when all of our earthly goals are being met and we're joy enjoying the kind of lives that we, I guess we want to have, we attribute this to the effectiveness of our own efforts and we forget about God. We don't recognize our need for God's help as long as we're getting along comfortably and we don't see that he's a part of it. You see, faith and love must be firmly fixed. In any case, whether it's because of times of stress, times of hardship, or on the other side, whether it's times of ease and it's times of comfort, we need to be aware every hour of every day of the danger posed to our devotion by both the good times and the bad times. As the Hebrew writer said, the hope that we have is our anchor. We need to be stable and immovable. Our faith and our love must and has to be firmly fixed. And so whether a particular day is good or a particular day is bad, we don't need God any more or any less on that day than any other. You know, we've gone from one side. Right, we had a great day. We had a lousy day. How about we had a day that, you know, nothing went wrong and, uh, you know, uh, nothing. there was no great windfall of things. You see what I'm getting at? Our love has to be anchored. Our faith and our love must be firmly fixed. And that means fixed means that they are attached to one another. The, the constancy of our need for God should be attached to the constancy of our love for him. That's faith and love firmly fixed. Did, did we get that? The constancy of our need for God should be reflected by the constancy of our love for him. That's when our lives are stable. That's when we've eliminated the variables. See, the variables in life are the good times and the bad times. You know, no day is exactly without anything going wrong and without some things going right. And without any doubt, the single, the single greatest thing 
that can stabilize our attitude toward God is meditation on the constancy with which he loves us. Hence, uh, the song service tonight dealt on the love of God. Even the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. Uh, God loves us. And we've been We've been studying in the book of Amos on Sunday morning. Uh, God has broad shoulders. He stayed with the children of Israel uh, through their idolatry, uh, 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 through their intermingling with other people that he told them not to. From the very beginning, he stayed with them when they wanted a king and he didn't want them to have a king. And God was so, so very patient with the children of Israel. We need to understand that the greatest thing that can stabilize our attitude uh, toward God is meditation on the consistency, on the constancy of how much God loves us and how patient he is with us. Um, Jane and I have a, a little joke sometime uh, when we look up at the moon at night and it's in a phase and Jesus will say, uh, Jesus, I'm sorry, Jane will say, is it waxing or waning? It's a term that's used with the phases of the moon. If the moon is if the moon is going from new moon where we can barely see it to full moon, every night it's waxing until it becomes full, and then through the next month, as the moon gets smaller and smaller, we say that the moon is waning. Our faithfulness should never wax or wane. We should always be at full moon. Our faith and love should always be firmly fixed. You know what? He continues to love us even on our worst days. When we choose for some reason or another by rebellious choice uh, to remove ourselves from the benefits of his love, to be sure if we turn back and we repent, he will penitently take us back. He's there waiting for us and he's waiting for us with a love that's just as great as his love was in the beginning. How can we not be moved by that? I'd like to finish the lesson in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. See, it's us that changes. Jesus does not change. And so we need to do everything we can to not be changed by circumstance. That whatever the circumstance is, that our love for God will not change diminish. How can we not be moved? How can we not be moved by his faithfulness to be firmly fixed in our faith and our love for him? Because he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I hope this lesson was beneficial to all of us that we all seen how we need to keep ourselves, as Jude says, 
in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. The only way that we can achieve eternal life is if we keep ourselves in the love of God. If you've not begun your Christian walk as yet, uh, we offer you the invitation to come to the Lord. And when you finally, through your belief and confession and baptism, have taken Jesus into your life, I believe it's then that this great love that we have for God starts waxing and that we are able to keep ourselves in the love of God, to keep our faith and love firmly fixed. If you haven't started your walk yet, we offer the invitation tonight. If you need to come to the Lord, get in touch with us. We are there. We will help you in whatever way that we can. Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the time that we've had together this evening. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we endeavor to do your will in all things. Help us uh, to rise with uh, Jesus on our lips. Help us to spend time in reading your word. And help us, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, we keep ourselves in the love of God and we keep our faith and our love firmly fixed. Bless us. Be with us through the evening. Help us to look forward to the next time we meet again. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Be safe and may God bless you all.